This is Home to All, an all-inclusive real estate podcast with your host, Nicholas Acosta. Nick sits down with guests to talk about real estate and how it works. Reach him at downtown.expert on Facebook and Instagram or his website, www.downtown.expert or call or text him at 407-508-8809. Enjoy the episode. Good morning, everybody, on this cooler than normal Tuesday morning here in Central Florida. I'm Nicholas Acosta. This is the show Home to All and All Inclusive Real Estate Podcast. This episode is brought to you by Blanchard Insurance. Uh, Blanchard Insurance is a paid sponsor of the show. Uh, again, joined by Mike Tonsetic with uh, Blanchard Insurance. Good morning, Mike. How are you doing today on this cold morning? Hi, uh, great. Um, it's actually not my preferred weather. I'm good when it gets down. I love 70s. I love 80s. I love even 60s. But 40s, 50s, I, it's not my thing. <laughs> That's why I got the fire going on in the background uh, behind me. And uh, I've lived in Alaska before, and uh, I lived there for two years back when I was a kid. But I've been climatized so much to Florida that it's a very – painful morning for me but i'm uh, i'm struggling along i hope it warms up a little bit so no i mean I, it's yeah i mean i'm from florida too so this is unusual but yesterday actually we were out walking our normal walk of course it started out yesterday it was warm because we're yeah. in florida um then it started raining and <laughs> i did not that i swear that the rain as it was coming down uh turned into uh a little bit yesterday it was basically, you know, the rain was freezing. Like sleep, yeah. Like sleep. And I'm like, wait a minute. I started my walk when it was hot out. Now it's cold and now it's raining. And then sleeting, basically. Not, yeah. I mean, not like a northern sleet. It was Florida, so it was melting, obviously. <laughs> Florida's crazy. I mean, the weather just down here is turns on a dime. But uh, I don't know. Hopefully it, it warms up a little bit because, like I said, I'm, I'm, I'm in pain right now. <laughs> Oh, no, it's all good, man. So, yeah, we, we were talking in pre-show. Uh, so what's going on in terms of, like, we're getting to the end of the year, and a big thing coming up now for people is looking into health insurance. We were talking a little bit about that, and especially that article that you found on NPR.org which I can pull up in a second. Go ahead and touch on that if you don't mind. Yeah, um, I know open enrollment is still going on right now. I believe we got about like another week. And our agency brokerage has never really been involved in individual health care uh, to an extent like some other agencies have who you know have huge you know individual health divisions or that's solely what they do. And uh, recently we announced that we, are getting like kind of into the ring and the reason we're getting into the individual health insurance market is basically because of the demand from our clients and demands from like friends and family but also a demand to kind of fix i think what is a broken system right now and uh, yeah, I blogged about this yesterday. And I think this is a very important, great article. And it, it kind of popped up on my right radar without even like looking for it. But this year, I've been contacted by so many people asking if we do health insurance and you know earlier this year and we did and recently we're starting to get into it in 2021 it's going to be the really the year that we step into the ring and put our foot in the circle and start you know helping our clients out with individual health care uh the reason i never liked it before was because like i said it is a broken system and now and what these people were calling me about was hey i have these plans they're non-compliant plans with, you know, Affordable Health Care Act, or they're not Obamacare compliant, however you want to word it that. And they went, same story. Everybody goes into the doctor, their doctor's visit is covered, you know, they pay their copay, they can get a prescription of whatnot. But some of them went in and described exactly like what happened in this article. And what happened in this article is one of these guys, I believe he had like a United 
one plan or something like that. And it wasn't, you know, it wasn't a compliant plan with the Affordable Health Care Act. So he went to the doctor and the doctor, uh, sad story was, he said, you know, well, you have, I, I believe it was lymphoma and something on his spine, I believe was a tumor or something along those lines. And what had happened was he tried to get, he obviously had to have surgery, get chemo and all that. And when he went to file the claim against United One, they were basically considered it a pre-existing condition because he had been to a chiropractor for a back issue a couple years before and they basically denied it and they, I guess they're fighting it I mean they are not paying out on this claim to this day so it really and, it, and if people don't understand when you don't have these compliant plans that you know you are subject to pre-existing condition clauses you're subject to uh, lifetime you know medical limits you know the plan and has a lifetime. I mean, you're subjected to, you know, what was before Obamacare. And a lot of people don't realize that. And I've had people who've gone in for, you know, something wrong with their foot and winding up that they have had to have hip surgery that cost $50,000 and there was no coverage for that. Uh, and so they're always, you know, backpedaling and trying to get, you know, to open enrollment, go out in the marketplace and, you know, get these new plans. My take on it is, uh, and this is just a personal opinion, Opinion, and it's probably an unpopular opinion, uh, but there is a lot of money in non-Obamacare plans and non-marketplace plans. And I'm talking about some of the commissions, agents and brokerages make out there it could be in the thousands of dollars per just a family plan. I mean, I mean, they are making a ton of money on it. And one of the reasons is, is because a lot of these plans don't pay out these huge claims that are, you know, $80,000, you know, hospital bills. And when you get a compliant plan, uh, the agencies and brokerages, they are restricted in how much commission they can make. And I believe, I think it's about like $20 per life or something like that. So $20, $20 per person that you're insuring, which is not a lot. But again, to actually sign somebody up for a plan, it's not a lot of work either. I mean, like, you, you know, a good agent could probably do it in five or 10 minutes, you know, for a client picking out a plan and then, you know, the clients, you know, going and enrolling and, and whatnot. So I think there's a lot of money in it. And there, unfortunately, in this business, there's always been a lot of greed. And I think that's why those plans are pushed. So, uh, you know, my advice to people out there who are going into open enrollment or looking at their plan and questioning it, look at the coverages on your plan and consult somebody who's not in it for the money. It's not going to be, you know, a snake oil salesman and take a look at things like, you know, what are your deductibles? What are your co-insurance clauses? Are there pre-existing condition clauses? Are there lifetime benefits on there? Because the last thing you want to do is to be negotiating with somebody like Florida hospital for a hundred thousand dollar bill and trying to, you know, declare yourself indigent to get out of paying it. Cause I mean, that's, the end of the day that's what's probably the only option is going to happen yeah it's, it brings up when we're talking about this we've, we've talked about this many times mike uh, unfortunately with the coronavirus pandemic uh there is a lot of uh opportunists out there trying to take advantage of people uh to get those bigger commissions because one those people that are the sales people not all people out there all sales people are doing this but yeah the ones that are taking this opportunity are, you know, probably lost their job, lost their regular income. So they're trying to find ways to recoup that income faster. But unfortunately, it harms the consumers by getting uh, the, like it says on the NPR article, about dumb coverage instead. Yeah. And I, I, I don't like, and I, I, when I blogged about this the other day or, or made a post about it, I said there's two things that I don't recommend anybody gambling with, and that's your health and your life. You know, if you want to gamble, go to Vegas. Don't right. don't bet on your health. Don't bet on your life. We see, we unfortunately, we've paid out life insurance claims. We've, you know, I've seen health insurance claims. Uh, that's stuff that can, you know, bankrupt the family, ruin lives. And it's something you never want to gamble with. And that's why uh, we've always, well, in everything we do, we try to be ethical and, you know, um, 
you know, watch out for the cons consumer because that's the last thing I want to do is tell somebody, guess what? You know, you're gonna have to declare bankruptcy because I sold you, you know, you know, a policy that doesn't cover, you know, cancer or, right. you know, hey, uh, you know, I sold you a life insurance policy because I've had that happen in my family. I mean, uh, when my father passed away years ago, he had been sold this life insurance policy that was worth, you know, a few hundred thousand dollars. And luckily he had other policies in place at the time uh, to leave behind to my mother. But when this one policy he had bought, he thought it was something, it was something else. And then when it came time to claim the benefits, uh, there was about a thousand dollars like left in the policy benefit. They had drained it that much and he didn't know. I mean, and you know, it, it's sad that he got sold that policy and he got sold it by the military, which was, uh, you know, a military insurance company, which was kind of sad, but, but uh, again, those are the two things I say, never gamble with, you know, again, life and your health. Uh, don't, if it seems too good to be true, if the rate's low, I uh, pay a little bit more and make sure you're taking care of that. No, I, I completely agree more. That's something that my father, late father instilled in me was, you know, especially him being a physician for 46 years that you're, you don't gamble with your health, like you said, or yeah. your life. So um, definitely Mike. So what about home insurance? What's going on with that? I know it's been a while since we've been on the show together, but what's going on with that out there? Oh, it is unfortunately, and I'm going to hit me Debbie Downer today, but it is getting worse, uh, especially here in Central Florida. One of the largest, uh, well, actually, in fact, they are the largest home insurer in the state of Florida, uh, just closed down Orange and Osceola County. And the reason behind that was, since all the other companies that we've been discussing over the past few months have been closing down in Central Florida because of all the hail and roof fraud and whatnot, uh, this company had been picking up a lot of the slack, picking up a lot of the uh, uninsured people out there uh, or the people who are getting non-renewed and whatnot. So basically the slack of all the other insurance companies. So they've recently hit capacity and they've shut down. And that's amazing. When you start seeing some of the largest insurance companies in Florida kind of start shutting down because of the capacity issues, that's really scary. And it's getting worse. And actually... Um, I don't know if you can pull this up. I believe it's on my personal feed, but uh, the Orlando Sentinel, uh, which always seems to be about a you know a couple months behind on issues like this, they actually put an article out in the Sunday paper about the uh, about the homeowners insurance crisis, about the rates that are going through the roof and continually go through the roof. And it's it's an interesting article because I mean it gives both takes on uh, the insurance company side, but it also gives the take on the, unfortunately, I think, on the personal injury side where the personal injury attorneys are kind of like, you know, we're making tons of money, but they're, they're kind of pitch selling to the consumer is like, well, if we weren't here, the insurance companies wouldn't pay out any claims, which, you know, I, I'm not going to, I'm not going to name names on that or, you know, argue to the fact, you know, about, you know, personal injury attorneys, but, you know, I, I see their point of view, even though I think it's wrong, but it just shows you that this battle is going to continue. I mean, it's, it's not going away anytime soon. It's going to be two or f two to five years at least till things get sorted out. I mean, in Florida, the only chance for Florida is, and I know this is going to sound very horrible to say, but the only chance for Florida for this to go away is catastrophes in other states. And I'm talking tornadoes and hurricanes hitting somewhere, which is going to take the roofing industry and drive it northward because they're not going to stop until every roof in Florida has been replaced two or three times. And they've made money. And if you read that article, it will show you the statistics. I mean, when they're, you know, when a, when a roof claim that traditionally should cost anywhere between, you know, ten fifteen thousand dollars on a two thousand you know square foot shingle roof, that some of these claims are with these attorneys fees are skyrocketing up into the hundreds of thousands of dollars per claim. It's insanity. 
And but you know that I mean, coming from the right. side on the auto side, I mean, like even auto claims, it's it's insane in Florida. I mean, it always has been. And they actually did in that article say, like, I, I've always used this expression about the Florida insurance industry, where that is, you know, the wild, wild west. And actually, somebody in that article said the same thing. And I was like, finally, somebody is like listening. Uh, so that's what's going on. Um, my, I was thinking about this this morning, too, of whether long term this is actually going to affect the real estate industry in Florida. Uh, you know, is real estate going to take a little bit? Is it going to impact it in the fact that people are going to slow down on buying homes because they realize they can't get insurance on them? I mean, I'm wondering, especially on the coastal homes, I'm wondering long term how that is going to impact. It doesn't seem to be slowing down right now because I was actually just talking to somebody the other day who uh, just bought a house over on, you know, backside of Disney on 429. And I asked her, I was like, have things slowed down over there because, you know, Disney's, uh, you know, not at full capacity and because of, you know, COVID. And she's like, no, the builders are still building. And I, I think it's like they're, you know, I think the builders to a degree are in a little bit of a panic. I mean, they're trying to finish these developments and the developers are trying to finish and get out and sell as quick as possible because they don't like what the future holds. Uh, and I think, you know, especially in this local economy where you have, you know, you know, God knows, you know, 100,000 people probably laid off like right now with the entire service industry. So it's, it's going to be real interesting to see, you know, how the real estate market uh, is impacted, if at all. So. No, I, I mean, um, yeah, I, I agree on that. Um, well, you, you guys know with my Kissimmee listing, which which was awesome that we, we closed on Friday. Yeah. Uh, that was on the market for 80 some days before it went under contract. Wow. Um, but we all know is uh, my prediction or my thought is, I'll take on it and I'm sure you feel the same way, is if it had been a year ago before the COVID pandemic, because this house is literally house was literally 15, 10, 15 minutes to Disney World parks. Yeah, uh, a year ago it would have sold like that. Oh yeah, absolutely. And, yeah, but people that were investing in that area, like I had investors look at the property, uh, but all the investors that came, like the person, the people that bought it were actually a family. Uh, but if I investors were that came through, uh, shied away from it because the uncertainty of the amusement parks or theme parks around it. Yeah, and I mean, if you're going back to you know 2008 era, you know, with the housing crisis, uh, we were very heavily saturated down in Osceola County. And we had been for like, uh, gosh, going back into the 90s, we actually were partnered uh, with a builder at one time. And I mean, they were just building houses down there. And I can tell you for a fact in 2008, where we saw, because we're notified, obviously, when, you know, uh, homes go into foreclosure as the insurer or, you know, if somebody files a bankruptcy and whatnot, uh, you know, the bank is the first one who reaches out to us. And I can tell you for a fact that our highest concentration of homes that went into foreclosure were down in Kissimmee and Osceola. And it was all due to, um, you know, basically that theme parks, people were down there, you know, making, uh, you know, you know, barely, able to get by and they had these balloon notes that were, you know, about to balloon and or inflate, I guess. And they didn't have enough money to stay in the, for the home. So they're just walking away. And, you know, most of our vandalism claims came down there. Most of our theft claims were coming out of there. So I, out of all the areas that we saw get hit was unfortunately Osceola because they're so dependent on the service industry down there. And it's not just the parks too. I mean, I was talking to somebody the other day and it was about, you know, the hotels and, you know, what's happening with them. And I mean, even like, you know, they were, I, I knew somebody who worked at uh, Shingle Creek and uh, Harris Rosen hated to lay off people and furlough people, but unfortunately he got to a point where he had to. So when you're talking about, you know, it's just not the parks, it's, it's all the hospitality in that area. Oh, no, most definitely restaurants, hotels, uh, businesses that uh, specifically, uh, let's just give you an example. There is a restaurant at City Walk. I'm going to say it wrong. It's called the Tucson Factory or whatever it's called. It's sure, sure. a restaurant themed from like steampunk era over at Universal. Yeah. And a year ago, uh, I tried to get into that restaurant and 
there were like maybe three, four hour waits. Yeah. So on the 27th or the weekend of my birthday, which was on a Sunday after the birth, my birthday. Um, and that day I, we were able to walk right in, no wait whatsoever. So it was weird. So that, like you're saying, restaurants are, are like hotels on restaurants are being affected too. Um, I've never seen a no wait for this restaurant. I like think, a- I think one of the lessons to be learned from all of this, and I've even thought about it for our own business here at Blanchard, and even like real estate, uh, even uh, bars and restaurants, or any type of small business, any you know small to mid cap business, I've said my thought is prepare by diversification. And what I mean by that is uh, like if you own a bar and your hours of operation are between four and midnight during the weekday and maybe, you know, you know, noon to two o'clock in the morning, these bars, a lot of these bars need to open up, you know, why wouldn't you just open up a coffee shop during the day, diversify, Uh, you know, host uh, continuing education for realtors, uh, do more events, uh, even the restaurants, I mean, I know they're kind of typecast, but I think they uh, get into this most issues like you were talking, like, if, well, if you own a steampunk restaurant, I mean, like, you are one thing. There is no opportunity to, to uh, diversify. Uh, or if you own, like, a small restaurant, like, do you have delivery operations? Do you have to-go operations? I mean, what's your plan if people can't come in? Even in my own business, I'm looking at, you know, okay, well, the homeowners insurance market is getting real bad. So what are our plans to diversify? I mean, we're in other states as well, but it is to get to a point where we're going to get more into, you know, remediating claims. Are we going to get into some type of property management at some type, you know, some type of ancillary, you know, revenue stream to balance things out if things go bad? And I think a lot of businesses would be smart to try to do that. Like be very versatile in what you can do in situations like this. I mean, I'd love to, like, I, I think that I'd love to see that happen, you know, here in Orlando, uh, especially in the service industry, because I think a lot of them can, uh, you know, be more versatile in what they do. And that's you know, kind of my, my two cents on it. No, I, I like that idea you gave me what, and then bring you, uh, everybody ideas about the, as you probably know or not know, I, I don't know if I told you or not, I got my, finally got my instructor's license um, and yeah, I yeah. a real estate school to teach online. Uh, talking about diversification, um, I know I shouldn't say it, but um, the thing is that the company I worked for for 20 years, Progressive Insurance, when I was a claims adjuster, if anything, that I'm, one of the many things I'm grateful for them teaching me in business was about diversification, about how reorganizing and restructuring, especially when there's downturns in the economy or changes in consumer demand. Um, and that's what I'm very grateful. One of the many things I'm grateful for that company, uh, because I'm applying all those things that I learned um, into my real estate business now, currently. They, they are a company that we have really followed closely and, you know, over the years and we kind of mirror ourselves instead of after, you know, every other competitor in town, if it's an agency or brokerage or even some of the largest in the world, the two companies that I mean, love them, love it or hate it that I follow and that we follow here, have always been progressive and Geico and they are so forward thinking in what they do and people don't really think because they don't really see behind the curtain like you've seen and like I still see on a daily basis. But then you look at their numbers. I mean, Progressive grew at 14%, uh, you know, which is double digit. Nobody grew at double digits like they have, but they're very smart in what they do and they're very calculated and and how they diversify the portfolio and, and like what they're doing. I mean, uh, they recently got in the homeowners insurance game with American Strategic teaching about, you know, what going on about like 10 years ago, and they're slated to become one of the largest, if not the largest homeowners insurer uh, in the United States in 10 years, which took, you know, a company like State Farm, you know, 50 to 100 years to do. So they're very, they're very in- intelligent what they're doing. Geico, the, the same thing. Uh, but at the core of those two companies, what people don't realize what they do better than anybody else is the claims handling, 
and the service behind that claims handling. I don't care what anybody says, they are by far statistically the best in the business. And we see it on a daily basis. And I think it's that that they put all of their effort into that, that makes them see a successful company. You can look at the competition, the, the competitors who don't actually lose market share. Oh, they taught me a lot of discipline, especially from being, being them being very strong in, in Geico and Progressive, being strong in claims handling and follow up with customers because trust me, uh, their strictness is was well worth it. Yeah, and their discipline was well worth it because it is nothing that made me. Exist. I've only been in business as a broker now for four months, and I'm growing at record numbers. But I have a lot of gratefulness and thankfulness to Progressive for being on top of me and. Essentially, micro, well, yeah, micromanaging me, but it was, you know, I was frustrated at the time. Uh, it's sort of like your parents, when your parents are growing up, yeah. they say, you got to do this because it's important when you get older. And then you tell your parents as a teenager or, or when you're nine or 10, you say, oh, what are you talking about? You don't know anything about this. And your parents are like, well, I lived your life before. I'm, I'm older now and wiser. And then you tell them, oh, whatever. And then when you get to this age, like now I'm like, I have a lot of things I do in my life. I'm like, oh my God, my dad and my mother or my grandparents were right, even though I told them no way when I was a kid. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, exactly. That's the best analogy. I think that they can come into this conversation. So I thank you for that because that is completely true. Those two companies look at the long-term goal and the long-term growth. And even in small business, yeah, like around here, I mean, I feel like I'm always, when somebody asks my opinion, I feel, I feel like I'm always telling them the same thing over and over again in redundancy, which is you're putting the cart smiles in front of the horse. Mm -hmm. And you need to look at what the long-term growth is. I mean, you're not going to grow overnight and, you know, and become a millionaire because it's not sustainable. It's not realistic. Uh, I would rather grow a little bit slower yeah i mean you're gonna have you know periods of ups and downs and booms and slowdowns and whatnot but if you you want it to be sustainable and that's how we've grown our business here is that it's sustainable i mean like we can survive things like covid we can survive things like the housing crisis of 2008 because we never put the cart in front of the horse and i think people look at these especially when it comes to problems uh especially during covid some of the observations i've seen are they try to do these big changes which yield small results when they really should be focused on what can I do on a daily basis? What's a small thing I can do? And a lot of those small activities and changes actually add up into the same big result that you're expecting. But, you know, it's kind of like, well, you know, let's say I do own a restaurant and it's like, oh my God, I'm panicking because of COVID, you know, so I'm going to go out and buy another restaurant or I'm going to go out and buy another business. It's like, no, I mean, you should be looking at how can I increase my delivery? How can I increase my marketing? Uh, stuff that's really cost effective uh, as compared to trying to, uh, you know, put this huge bandage on something that's, you know, going to bleed regardless. I oh, know. Yeah, I completely agree with you. That's what it's all about. The small little strides that lead up to the big one. Because if you're expecting to become a millionaire overnight, you're going to ultimately <laughs> fail in a business. Yeah. Yeah, and you have to have confidence too. And I, I've seen that during COVID too. A lot of businesses, uh, they when they make these small changes, they're doing them out of panic. And it's like if you don't, if you every decision that you make in business, in my opinion, if it's not a confident decision and you don't back that with confidence, it's going to fail. And I mean, I'm talking about the little wins that you do on a daily basis, unless you have confidence and are rewarding yourself. And I'm not talking about, you know, you know. I mean, if you want to take yourself out to dinner, you know, pat yourself on the back, but just to have the confidence that you know and knew and put a smile on your face at the end of the day, that's the best thing you can do. No, I couldn't agree more. So, Mike, we have like a little bit less than a minute left. Um, is there anything you want, a piece of advice? We, and we're going to also, everybody out there will be on again Thursday to talk about other topics and probably we'll touch on this topic again, but anything else you want to give advice to for up until Thursday? Or whenever? <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, 
I mean, I think we touched on a lot today, but the, I think the recurring theme here is for people to slow down and think about what they're doing, especially on the health insurance side. I uh, don't just do it to get, you know, to get health insurance, actually take a look at it. Like we said, you know, take your parents advice, you know, what, what could happen down the road five years from now or a year from now, take, they take your parents advice. Same thing on the homeowner's insurance. You know, you want a company, you're, yes, we hope your house doesn't burn down to the ground in this fire behind me, but take the time, pay a little bit more, invest in your future, save a little bit of money. You know, you put your parents advice in your ear. And, and then as we ended it, when you're talking about small business, uh, plan ahead. I mean, I, I, I kind of kind of like tiresome of people just like, you know, they're planning, they're, they're living their lives by the next day, which I think is kind of crazy. <laughs> so again, slow down, listen to what your parents said, and you know, a lot of people will be better off. Well, awesome. Thank you. I couldn't agree more with that. Uh, the, like, one of the thing I was thinking was don't live by the seat of your pants. That's exactly. The, the phrase exactly. I was thinking when you said that. Well, Mike, as always, great conversation. Absolutely. Today. And uh, we'll be you. back here on Thursday. No, thank you for being on and thank you guys for being a sponsor. Um, this has been Home to All and All Inclusive Real Estate Podcast, coming to you live from downtown Orlando. I'm Nicholas Acosta, licensed real estate broker with Downtown Expert Realty. Again, Blanchard Insurance. Uh, check them out. They uh, get a quote. Uh, exceptional customer service over there. Thank you again, Mike. Thanks, Nick. All right, you guys. You guys have a good day, and I'll see you guys Thursday. Sounds great. Look forward to it. Bye. This has been Home to All, an all-inclusive real estate podcast. Find Nick on Facebook and Instagram at downtown.expert and also his website, www.downtown.expert or call or text him at 407-508-8809. Thanks for listening. Instead of spending hours or even days looking for your new home, let a downtown Central Florida expert guide you. Hi, I'm Nicholas Acosta, and I'm here to welcome you home. Being a Florida native, I know how exciting, convenient, and stylish the downtown Florida lifestyle is. Whether you're entertaining your guests or enjoying the views, Central Florida downtown has a lot to offer you and your family. Buying, selling, or investing, I'm your downtown Central Florida expert. 407-508-8809.